This is fun. We're having fun. Oh, yeah. ah. <laughs> <laughs> passport. <laughs> Who brings their passport? Try side. <laughs> oh my God. Hey. So as you can see, it was a pretty uh, wild weekend uh, out in Malaysia for the first round of the 2023-2024 Asian Le Mans series. Now that I'm back, had a few days to sort of digest the event and recover a little bit. I'm still super jet lagged and super tired, but I figured I'd take some time to recap that event for you. Uh, the recap I did of the Indy 8 Hour, a lot of people said in the comments they really liked that format of me just talking about the event, the equipment I used, why I did certain shots. So figured I'll continue with that and we'll start with the first round of Asian Le Mans. So hopping into a little bit about the championship, the Asian Le Mans series is an ACO rules championship. So similar to IMSA, the European Le Mans series and the WEC. It has three classes of cars, LMP2, LMP3 and GT, which is GT3 spec cars. Now this championship is always very highly subscribed with a lot of entries because the champion of LMP2 and GT gets an entry into the following year's 24 hours of Le Mans. Now this is a pro-am championship, meaning that every entry has to have at least one bronze rated or amateur driver in the lineup. Now this championship used to be in Asia, they do like a round in Thailand, a round in Australia, a round in uh, you know, Malaysia, and they'd move it around. But uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, they actually moved the championship to the United Arab Emirates with two races one weekend in Dubai and two races the following weekend in Abu Dhabi. That's how it was when I shot it earlier this season in February. They did that for three years and now they decided to start slowly going back to Asia. Now it is more expensive to trek everyone all over Asia and freight the cars and everyone, especially the team owners, loved when the championship was just in the UAE over those 10 days because it was so much more affordable to just send your crew on one trip, freight the cars one time, and have everything in basically one or two locations, like I said, with Dubai and Abu Dhabi. But they're slowly going back to Asia. So this year, the championship is the two rounds that I shot in Malaysia. Their races were Saturday and Sunday, so two four-hour races. And then we'll have one round in Dubai in February, where we'll have one four-hour race. And then the following weekend, we'll go to Abu Dhabi down the road, but an hour and a half drive. And we'll do two four-hour races again. Five races in total, three events, five rounds and that's the whole championship. Now, as you can imagine, this was a lot of travel to get out to Malaysia. Where I live in Canada, it doesn't really matter if you fly west or east, you're going to basically spend the same amount of time on airplanes. Now, to save money, I opted to fly over Europe, so I flew from Toronto to Amsterdam. It was a six and a half hour flight. I had a long layover in Amsterdam, and then I flew 12 and a half hours to Malaysia. Now, usually it's shorter, but right now, because of uh, obvious reasons, you can't fly over Russia. Now I got in very early. I got in on the Monday before the race weekend, which gave me some time to get acclimated. I picked up Michele Scuderio, who I traveled with and uh, shared a rental car with. And I picked him up at the airport. We had dinner and then we got some sleep. And then Tuesday, we actually spent some time exploring Kuala Lumpur. We went to the Batu Caves and we went into uh, the Petronas Towers and checked everything out. Michele did some Christmas shopping and it was just cool to get a little bit of scenics uh, from you know downtown KL. So now let's talk a little bit about the track. And first we have to talk about pronunciation. Now I called the track what everyone calls it in English, which is Sepang International Circuit. But I had several people clowning me on social media saying that's not how you pronounce it and it's disrespectful. And it's actually pronounced like Serpunk or Serpuk. Like it's a very difficult pronunciation if you don't speak Malay. Now I was told by the commentators at the track that the English pronunciation is Sepang, similar to the way that the French call it Paris, and English people call it Paris, so calling it Sepang is totally fine. So in this video, I'm gonna call it Sepang. Now this track is located near the airport, which is amazing because there's airport hotels, which are usually cheaper, and it's a very quick in and out. It's like 25 minutes drive from the airport. Most teams stay at the famous Sama Sama Hotel. We stayed at a Holiday Inn. It was nice, it was 12 minutes from the track, so it was fantastic, a perfect location. So I might get labeled like uh, as being very negative, but much like the Indy 8 hour video, um, I really didn't enjoy this circuit very much. I don't think it's one of my favorite circuits to shoot. In fact, I think I would rather shoot the Indy road course. Um, this might be one of my least favorite circuits I've ever filmed at, unfortunately. 
It kind of falls into the category of F1 circuits that my friend Jamie and I always talk about where it's a grade one FIA circuit. So there's lots of paved runoff and you're really far from the cars in a lot of locations. Like even some of the tight corners, you're very far away and it's hard for video to show really fast action a lot of the time other than like panning shots, which get kind of old after a while. So you do have to work pretty hard. I still got some stuff I'm very happy with, but it's not a circuit that I'm like, you know, frothing at the mouth to go back to. So let's take a look at the track map. Now, F1 fans are probably gonna boo. It was designed by Herman Tilk, uh, who's known for, everyone says his race tracks are boring, but honestly, if you watch some of the early F1 races here, uh, they were all pretty much bangers and it's a very interesting track. I love playing it in the F1 video games as much as I don't really enjoy shooting it. It's 5.543 kilometers or 3.445 miles for my Imperial friends. And it has quite a lot of elevation change, which usually makes for more interesting racing. Now to get around the circuit, it's obviously quite big, but it was easy to get around in terms of there being access roads in both the inside and the outside of the circuit that just followed all the way around. Michaeli and I actually rented a scooter and shared it. It cost about $200 US to rent from the circuit for the week. And they were legit scooters or 125 CC. So it was a bit sketchy with both of us on the scooter, especially in the rain that we had on Saturday. But it made getting around much easier. For this event, I was working with Optimum Motorsport. They're a race team based in the UK, and I've worked with them before in IMSA and in some GT races in mainland Europe. They're a great group to work with. For this championship, they were racing two McLaren 720S GT3s. So this meant that I didn't have to worry about either prototype class, which honestly made shooting a lot easier. I only had to worry about one of the three qualifying sessions, and I was contained in one garage. So it meant that I wasn't running up and down the pit lane, which was bad for my step count, but was great for my sanity. So I only had to be in one spot, which was amazing. Most of my focus for the event was on the team's customer racing in the number 69 car. Nice. All right, so let's hop into the gear. Once again, I know in my most asked questions video, I said I wasn't really interested in talking about gear, but I've decided recently that it makes sense to talk a little bit about gear and it's very helpful for people. So today I'm gonna to talk again about the gear that I used for the event. So for cameras, I used the FX6 as my main camera, and then I had the A7S III for mostly gimbal and then a little bit of vertical work that I did. For lenses, I had uh, two Sigma lenses, a 50 millimeter 1.4, as well as a 24 to 70 F2.8. And then I had a 70 to 200 millimeter F2.8, and I used a two times teleconverter. I should have honestly just brought my 100 to 400. That would have been a lot better. It's a lot of a sharper lens. A teleconverter is a great way to extend the reach of your lens without having to buy another lens. Like that 100, 400 cost 3,300 bucks and a teleconverter is like 600 bucks. And then you can turn your 70 to 200 into a 140 to 400. Now it's not going to be quite as sharp and it is going to double your aperture. So my F2.8 went to F5.6 with a teleconverter on it, but it worked just fine for the event. And in hindsight, yeah, I should have brought the 100 to 400, but the teleconverter worked just fine. Now I did take one special lens with me. I took the Helios 44 II, which is a vintage lens that was made in the former Soviet Union. And it's really become a meme in the videography community. It's become like everyone's secret lens, yet everybody has one. <laughs> so it's not really a secret. And there's a joke where it's like, yeah, they say they use vintage lenses, but they just have the Helios and everyone knows about it. So I used it, it was a modified version that kind of became like a cheater anamorphic. So it made some really interesting flares. I didn't use it that much because we didn't have any sessions at night and we never really got any good light. There was never like a sunset or anything. The sessions ended too early, but I did end up using it on one piece of content, which you can see over on my Instagram. It's kind of like a cinematic, like real, trending thing right now. I'm debating making an entire video about this lens because it is such an interesting lens that a lot of people like. So if you're interested in that, let me know in the comments. Other than cameras and lenses, I did have my Ronin RS2 gimbal, uh, my Nisi filters, both ND and CPL, as well as my DJI wireless mics, which I'm wearing right now, and my Sennheiser mic that I use on the FX6 to capture ambient audio. If you wanna learn more about any of my gear, it is all linked in the description below. Now I mentioned this is the first round of the Asian Le Mans series and that it was two races, one Saturday and one Sunday. For the purpose of today's recap, I'm just gonna talk about the race on the Sunday or else this will be way too long, but let's still go through a little bit of the buildup and background uh, leading into that race. 
So Wednesday was the first day we went to the track. It was just the usual uh, setup day where you film the cars in the garage. There's some pit stop practice happening. There was a group photo. So we got a little bit of behind the scenes. We did a little bit of the track walk. Nothing super crazy. I actually didn't end up using a lot of what I shot on the Wednesday. The first on-track running was on Thursday. They had these two official test sessions. Now it was kind of weird because the first one was an hour and a half and there was a 15 minute break and then the second one started and it was two hours. So it was kind of just one long session. But we got lots of content in both pit lane and trackside. I should also say Michaeli and I spent some time on Wednesday doing a recon on our scooter, just trying to planning out where we wanted to go and see, okay, what does this corner look like? What kind of shot can you get here? If you don't do that, if you don't take time ahead of the session to recon, you're really setting yourself up for failure. Because these sessions, as much as you think, oh, they're an hour and a half, they go by incredibly fast, especially if there's a red flag. This lap was also about two minutes for a GT car. So in an hour session, best case scenario, the car is gonna come by 30 times and you're never gonna get a best case scenario. So reconning is always super important. I highly recommend you do that every time you get to a new racetrack. It's just like going on a site visit before you shoot a wedding. I should also say that during this recon, we saw an iguana or some kind of lizard. I assume it's an iguana, maybe like a monitor lizard, I don't know. But we saw it run across, Michaeli was like, whoa. He thought that was crazy. I was very excited and I was determined to get one of these things on video during this week and more on that later. On Friday, they had two more practices. There's another three hours of running, free practice one, free practice two, same kind of thing. There was an hour break. And then Saturday morning, they had qualifying for both races. That was one session for each class. And it was just your first fastest lap set the grid for the first race and your second fastest lap set the grid for the second race, which was great because we didn't have to have two separate qualifyings. So kind of a unique way of doing it, but I was a big fan. Race one on the Saturday went by fairly quickly. I got everything I needed and we even got a heavy like torrential downpour near the end of the race, which is terrible for the drivers, but great for us to get awesome shots like the ones that you see here. I only got one or two shots of my client cars, unfortunately, but I did get some bangers of the other cars. Uh, this actually led to a red flag as the rain got so heavy. We were getting absolutely pelted like you saw in the beginning of this video. And they ended up ending that race about 15 minutes early due to the red flag that came out. And now my feet are wet. Okay. <laughs> Let's hop in to the race on Sunday now. We rolled into the media center around 9 a.m. and got set up for the morning warm-up session at 10.30. It was a 15-minute session just for the cars to check on things, make sure everything was working. So we just hung out in the garage for that. Not really enough time to go trackside. Had the light been amazing, we would have gone trackside, but at 10.30 in the morning, it was just flat light, gray, not super interesting. So we went to the pit lane. Since we're talking about the pit lane, I should also mention that just like in the Indy 8-hour video, I had to wear a full fire suit and a helmet to be allowed in the pit lane, which was not fun in the Malaysia heat and humidity. And uh, you actually also had to wear it if you wanted to go on the grid. More on that later. Following warm up, we went down to the catering to grab a quick lunch. Uh, they actually had a full Italian crew with like a pizza oven and a pasta station. They were making pizzas. It was incredible. We ended up eating pizza like twice a day, every day, um, which is not good for your waistline, but there's no calories at the racetrack. So eat all the pizza you want. And before you could turn around twice, it was basically time to head to the grid. So as I mentioned earlier, you do have to be wearing a full fireproof suit to access the grid while the cars are still rolling. Apparently you might spontaneously combust or something. I don't know, uh, but it was super hot. So wearing a fire suit was not a lot of fun. It was 36 degrees Celsius and 90% humidity and the sun was shining. So it was uh, treacherous conditions down on the grid before the start. I did get a few select shots down on the grid, but it was a very quick grid rock. It was six minutes from the time they let the VIPs on to the time they evacuated the grid. But I did have time to say hi to a few people and wish a few people luck. We hoofed it back to the media center to change out of our race suits and hop on the scooter to go to the final turn to shoot the start. Now, normally I would just wear my fire suit for the first part of the race so I can go straight to the pit lane, but it was just too hot and it was not gonna make sense to wear it for that length of time. Michaeli had the idea to actually shoot the race start from the final turn rather than just go to turn one again, which we had done for race one. I didn't really end up using this shot for the, any of my content because both my cars were like pretty far back on the grid. So a start shot wasn't really super important. You can really see what I mean in this shot, how far away you are at Sepang. This is at 400 millimeter and it's still just it just doesn't look super exciting because you are so far away from the cars. I spent the next half hour or so shooting both wide and tight panning shots in this area of the circuit. Uh, it was nice because the cars go by on either side, so you're getting them like twice a lap and you can get a lot of shots in a short amount of time. 
I find that when I shoot these wider angles, uh, I like to have like the tire barrier in the foreground because with it whizzing by, it almost seems like it, everything's just moving a little bit faster, if that, if that makes sense. Let me know in the comments if you agree. I, I think that anyway. So I like having something in the foreground. I dropped Michele off inside of turn five since he wanted to pan through the palm trees. I decided to go to the outside of five and grab a rear shot, which I ended up really liking. But of course, right as I got there, there was a safety car. And unlike photographers, I can't really shoot the cars under safety car because it's easy to tell on video that they're going slower. So I kind of just had to chill. But it was at this point that I got the shot that I had been dreaming of all weekend long. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Iguana Cam. His name is Jub Jub, by the way. Uh, all iguanas are named Jub Jub. At this point, I was also really starting to feel the heat. I had been chugging water and liquid IV uh, all week to prepare for this event, but it was still a really tough slog. I keep myself in pretty good physical shape, but I was really suffering a bit. I ran out of water, but I was able to get some from some very kind marshals. I have to say all the marshals at Sepang were super helpful and super polite. They just would hop up and were really interested in just helping you with whatever you needed. So props to the marshals at Sepang. After getting a few more shots, I headed back uh, in to get changed and head to the pit lane for what ended up basically being the remainder of the race, basically the second half of the race. Uh, we had a lot of sessions all week, so I felt like I had a bucket load of trackside shots, and I just wasn't super inspired by the trackside locations, so I just prioritized shooting in the pit lane. I grabbed two more pit stops and driver changes. I got some really cool hero stuff, and I also got some mint burnouts. See folks, tire blankets are dumb. Just everyone should always be on cold tires. Let the driver's wheel spin. Like, think of the content. We also had time for a quick snack break. Uh, this back room in the garage was actually air conditioned. So it was amazing to just stand in there even for a few seconds. I decided to head back up to the media center to dump my memory cards and do a quick selection. And then it was time to head down to grab the garage celebration. Optimum's number 27 car ended up in P3. You'll notice here that I'm using the A7S 3 and I'm shooting vertical. Most of the stuff I was shooting of the 27 car was being delivered vertical. So I didn't need it for archived purposes. So I just, decided to shoot the celebration completely vertical to make sure it was cropped properly. A lot of the time when you shoot like standard 16 by nine and then try and crop it for vertical, it doesn't work that well. You don't get everyone in the frame that you want to. So I just decided, hey, let's just shoot it vertical, make sure we get the shot that we want. I also shot at 50 frames per second, which is something I rarely do and I'm not a big fan of, but it just gave me the chance to uh, convert it to slow motion if I wanted to. And if I found the motion blur didn't look right, I could add some in post. So let's talk about the podium. Now the podium, like most F1 spec tracks, was absolutely dreadful. They're designed so the fans can see the drivers, which is great. I love that the fans can be involved and they can see the drivers, but it's horrible for us shooting the podium. You can climb the starting tower to get a better shot, but of course this was crowded by Italian agency guys that had been camped there for 45 minutes. So I ended up having to shoot it from the ground. But luckily I was able to coach up the drivers before they went to the podium that when all was said and done, walk to the front of the podium, hold your trophies and we'll get a group shot. So it was fine, it ended up working out. We then edited into the night, uh, took a quick break to grab dinner at the catering again, uh, more pizza of course, and even some gelato to celebrate the end of the final race of the 2023 season for us. So kind of hit me right then. I was like, oh yeah, this is the last race I'm gonna shoot this year. I produced two short reels after the race. One was very simple, it took about five minutes to edit. It was just some celebration shots for Optimum to post right away. Nothing crazy, not super cinematic, just emotions, people hugging really quick and just sent that out. And then I also made a separate reel for the 69 car. Nice. If you wanna watch that video with audio, you can go check it out on my Instagram page. After the race, I drove Michele to the airport and then got back to the hotel, hit the pillow and was done. When it was all said and done, it was about a 14 hour day. So not a bad day at the racetrack. Although, like I said, not one of my favorite circuits to shoot. I'm, I'm sorry if it's your local track or it's one of your favorite circuits, but you have to remember, I rank circuits based on how they are to shoot and how they are to work at. And it was great working there. Media center was nice, but just, it just wasn't very inspiring to shoot. So it ranks near the bottom of uh, tracks that I've worked at. If I had to give the event a ranking, I would probably give it a six out of 10. It was all right, but overall it was a very meh week. We had a lot of track time, which led to a lot of overshooting. And honestly, by the halfway mark of the second race, I just started feeling lazy because I was just camped out in the pit lane and waiting for the next pit stop and thinking to myself, shouldn't I be shooting something? But I already had basically everything I needed. It was kind of weird, but honestly, 
it was kind of a little nice to have a less stressful race day. So that is my recap of the first round of the Asian Le Mans series for 2023, 2024. Please let me know in the comments below uh, what you thought of the video, uh, what, if you like the format and what I can do to improve it. I'm hoping to continue these videos into 2024 so your feedback is greatly appreciated. If you wanna keep track of all of my travels and the different races I work and stuff I'm not able to do long form content on, be sure you're following me on social media. I'm very active on Instagram and TikTok especially and the links are down in the description below. Finally, as I always say, likes, shares, and subscribes, they do go a really long way to help me make more of these videos, so I really appreciate that. We just hit 1,000 subscribers here on YouTube, so I'm hoping to continue and keep growing this channel just so I can share more of what I do with people. I know that I have a really cool job that a lot of people are interested in, so I love being able to share it with you and show you what it's like to do this. So again, if you like the video, please like, share, subscribe, even Drop it in your group chat, drop it in a WhatsApp group, send it to a friend that you think might like it, that's interested in racing or wants to be a videographer. I'd really appreciate that. Okay, so that's enough annoying self-promotion. Thanks so much again for watching and we'll see you in the next one.